students, right? Well, okay. uh, well, thank you for coming to the STEM Scholars presentation. Yeah. Uh, it has been more than a privilege for me to be part of this two-year cohort process and also the, the first cohort process as well. Um, when we thought about launching the STEM Scholars program, I thought I would go crazy, and I have. Uh, it is a lot of work that was involved into the, uh, but it was worth every second, every second, uh, even at the Hershey Park too. So it was kind yeah. of cool. People really get the, you know, you know, the rights. Uh, so the students are going to be talking about their um, two-year journey, and that's what I like to showcase today. What was the two-year journey? But before I do that, um, they were held by a confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement. Which means is they could not talk about this to anybody about what they were doing. They couldn't do any Facebook, and that's something is expected in the STEM industry. Is you're a hold, you can have a Facebook, maybe maybe you're not. Depends on the companies out there, but you're not supposed to be talking about your work. So they did that. So I'm going to share with that information, and as I pass this out to you, you are going to see is that they are no longer. And George, you know this news. So they are no longer held by that competition anymore. As a faculty. Um, and you know, I wear quite a different hat in this campus too. Uh, but more as a faculty, you know, when you went this program, I didn't see myself as a faculty. I saw myself as a mentor, and that's a huge, huge, huge thing. Uh, when a faculty becomes mentor, you have it made. Period. So, my mentees are my students, but my mentees, and I'm going to talk about the two-year term. So with that, let's come start this group. All right, so good afternoon. Like Dr. Raza said, we're the STEM Scholars. We've been doing this for two years now. My name is Noah Simmons. I'm Ali Khan. I'm Skylar Lowell. Stephen Treadwell. I'm Kayla Gales. I'm Jack Wheaton. All right, and that's a picture of us in the lab now. Um, so during this presentation, we're going to talk about the four classes that we did as a cohort. Um, the professional development, road trips, guest speakers, and then this last semester we've done uh, undergraduate research. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, so, Ali. So a little bit, bit of background of me. I came from Century High School. I took a career in tech class with uh, biomedical sciences, so I knew I wanted to go into a biology field. And a bunch of my family are doctors, and I knew that's what, where my interests lay. So I decided to um, take up general biology as my major and go into pre-med field. Um, so for me, I was actually homeschooled all my life. So um, coming to Carroll was a bit of an adjustment to the public setting, um, but I really enjoyed it. So in high school, um, I took a few computer programming classes and I kind of found that's what I like to do. Um, so when I came to Carroll, I was looking to major in computer science um, and then found out I'll be transferring to pursue that major, but um, that's where the STEM Scholars Transfer Program came in, so. So um, I am now uh, pursuing a major of forensic chemistry. However, like um, throughout high school, I was really undecided. And to be honest, watching a whole lot of Law and & Order and CSI kind of influenced my decision because I figured like, all that would be really interesting to uh, be around like chemicals, the gels, DNA, stuff like that. So, I think, so I'm really excited to pursue the major forensic chemistry in my future. Um, so for me, like Jack, I was also homeschooled all my life. Um, I did a dual enrolled program in my senior year of high school, started taking some classes here at Carroll. And um, I wasn't exactly sure where I wanted to go, um, and the STEM scholars definitely helped me get to where I am right now. Um, I'll be transferring to College Park uh, this fall and majoring in chemical and biomolecular engineering down there. I actually just graduated from Carroll Christian School last year, and I just finished my first year here at Carroll. And I always wanted to be a mechanical engineer because my dad is an engineer too. And after the semester long a project that relates to um, a lot of programming, I think I'm going to change my major to computer science and definitely major in mathematics. And uh, so I went to North Carolina High School and uh, while in high school I uh, attended the uh, Career Tech Center for uh, their engineering program. and. Um, there was a lot of like robotics and computer programming during that um, 
program, and that's why I found out that computer engineering seemed to be up my alley. And uh, in the fall, uh, I am on course to transfer to UMBC. Right. Now I'm going to hand the floor to Kayla, and she's going to tell you about the first course that we took as STEM scholars. So hello, um, STEM 101 was more focused on our professional development, so we can be shaped as more professional individuals. So one of the things we did was our business cards. We did this more for networking purposes, and uh, usually people our age don't carry around business cards with them, so we figured we would stand out more if we had them on us. Uh, as you can see from Noah's and Stevens. Uh, we also did our internship based resumes. So these sprung out because um, Dr. Raza asked us to attend a seminar where uh, there was a director of this summer internship called the GEMS program. And he wanted to, uh, us all to apply to that. So on the application, it wanted us to have a resume. So we made these to satisfy the requirements of that. Um, and I was lucky enough to be selected for that program, and I enjoyed my summer there. So it was, it was because of uh, Dr. Raza asking us to go to that seminar that I actually got involved with that. Uh, we also did our transfer resumes because we all plan to go to a four year after this. So uh, here are mine and Stevens as examples. So in the year of 2016, we made our resumes based on our prior knowledge of like what a resume should look like. Um, and then from there, in 2016, we made our prospective resumes of what we thought we would be two years from then. And uh, examples are Stephen and Noah. So we also did our thank yous. For, so the first one being our thank you letter to the foundation for funding the STEM scholars, uh, along with all the benefits that comes along with it. and making us better professionals in our fields of STEM. And we also constructed thank you emails um, along uh, our years here because we're thanking guest speakers such as Dr. Rook for giving their time to speak to us. Dr. Rook especially because she came in and told us about the transfer process over at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, we, al we also took the Myers-Briggs um, personality test where we can see if we're more extroverted or introverted, or if we are more judgmental or more perceptive, uh, things of that nature. So our results, most of us, or in the, out of the six of us, were more so introverted. Um, Ali was more extroverted, and Steven was more borderline, so he's more flexible with crowds and things like that. And uh, it showed us a lot about who we are as people and these are reflections of our results, whether we agreed or disagreed, and we explained why we were why we thought we were one thing as opposed to another. Uh, we also did our cover letters for our resumes. Uh, the cover letter is more so tailored to the college you want to go to. So with me wanting to go to Towson, I tailored mine to Towson. And with Noah wanting to go to the University of Maryland, he tailored more is more toward the University of Maryland. Uh, we, during this time, we also did our four-year college plan, two of the years being more focused here at Carroll and two of the years being focused wherever we wanted to go. Once again, since I wanted to go to Towson, I focused more toward Towson. And with Jack wanting to go to UMBC, he focused more toward UMBC. During this time, we also met with our advisors who use a website called Artsis to make sure uh, the classes we take here transfer and what classes didn't and so we can uh, build toward more of the courses we take over there. Uh, we also, as a group, constructed interview questions, uh, some being easier, some being harder, that we thought um, employers would ask when during the interview process. Uh, and then individually, we were asked to answer those questions more tailored toward our, us. So now, Jack would come up and uh, tell you about our guest speaker series. Um, so our second semester, we had a lot of guest speakers come in. Um, so we had a whole series of them. Um, we had some people come in from outside industries and with professional backgrounds. Um, we had some people come in from here at Carroll Community College. And then we also listened to several TED Talks online on the TED Talk website. Um, so our first speaker was Maria Burness, and she is the Chair of Engineering and Mathematics here at Carroll Community College. 
Um, so for each speaker, um, we did reflections on them. So each one of us did our own personal reflection on the speakers. Um, and then as a group, we did our group takeaways. So um, our takeaways from Ms. Burness were um, perseverance is really important when um, like in academics. So uh, not giving up when things get hard, keep pushing, um, keep pursuing what you enjoy to do. So um, another point she made was not being afraid to change directions or change majors. So when you find out um, something might not be for you, um, don't be afraid to change your direction and um, pursue something else. Um, our next speaker, so this was a TED Talk speaker, so we listened to her presentation online. Um, her name was Susan Colantuano. Um, again, we all did our own personal reflection, so this is Stevens here. Um, our takeaways from her were, uh, she talked about important qualities to have in the workplace environment. So um, one of the big ones she touched on was leadership and having leadership skills and also supervisory skills. So she said it's important to have these skills early on. So then that way, when you get the opportunity to be in a leadership position, um, you're ready for it. Um, and then she also talked about the gender gap in the workplace. She talked about the statistics on how women are less likely to get promoted, so they need to work harder to get their promotions. So that's another reason these skills are so important. Uh, our third speaker was Alan Kudmore. He's a computer engineer at NASA. He worked on the CUBE satellites. Um, so he came in to share with us uh, info about these CubeSats. Um, so very short what they are, they're small little computers called Raspberry Pis, um, which inspired one of our research projects, we'll talk about that later. Um, but basically it's a small computer you can send up into space. It's very small, it doesn't weigh too much, so it's a lot cheaper than sending like a full-on satellite. Um, so we each did our reflections and our takeaways were that Raspberry Pis are really interesting and intriguing little computers. They can really do a whole lot despite their size. Um, and then not only that, but they work fine in space. So um, our next speaker was Alain de Botton. Um, he was another TED speaker, so we listened to his presentation. Um, our takeaways from him were you shouldn't be afraid of failing or people putting you down because failure is something that happens to everybody. So um, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Just keep, keep working hard, keep trying again. Um, don't let that kind of thing put you down. Don't let other people put you down. Um, and then similarly, he talked about uh, you shouldn't judge people based on their position in life. So maybe somebody doesn't have too many achievements or um, too much of a background, but it's always important to give them an opportunity to make themselves shine and um, give them an opportunity to work hard. Um, this was a former Carroll student. His name was Gwen La. Um, he now works at Applied Physics Lab. Um, so he came in and uh, the biggest point he made was uh, we should research degrees and pathways ahead of time. Um, so more specifically, some colleges have certain degrees with certain descriptions or they'll say they lead to one path. Um, but when you pursue that degree, you find out later on that the um, professional industries are looking for something similar but not quite that exact degree. So you really want to research ahead of time uh, what those degrees and pathways lead to. Um, he also talked about how important networking is in the industry. Um, and I think networking also helped him get his job at APL. So it's really something that's key in the industry. Um, 
Tim League is the fiscal director here at Carroll Community College. Um, so he came in, he shared a little bit, a little bit about what he does. Um, he said one of the most important things is to love what we do. Um, whatever you have a passion for, um, that, that's kind of what you should pursue. Um, so uh, we should put that passion into our work, really enjoy what we do. Um, Simon Sinek was another TED speaker. Um, his presentation focused on this circle here. He called it the golden circle. So it was the what, how, and why behind everything. And the why in the middle was the main point he wanted to make. Lots of people consider like what we're doing or how we do it, but um, less people seem to consider why we're actually doing the things we do. So um, we took away that this is a good metaphor for human motivation and um, the reason behind your actions, like why are we doing things we're doing, such as research and things in professional fields, that kind of thing. Uh, Webb Smith was another speaker. He was uh, also working at APL. Um, so he came in and uh, he was actually our first introduction to the Applied Physics Lab. Um, and then he shared a little bit like um, briefly types of things that they do at that lab and um, talked about how they have internship opportunities and it's a great place to go to get started, like kind of get your foot in the door and um, get hands-on experience in a lab setting professionally. Um, and then again, another point that came up here was networking. Um, so again, it really shows how important networking is out in the professional environment. And then our last speaker we had was Larry Smith. So he was a TED Talk speaker. And um, he talked about uh, pursuing your passion um, and loving what you do. Um, and a big point he made was uh, like we shouldn't make excuses for not pursuing something we enjoy. So he argued that a lot of people will tend to say, oh, well, it's kind of too hard or oh, I'm kind of just an average person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too successful if I did that or that kind of thing. So he said, no excuses, do what you like. If you're really passionate about it, you're going to be successful. So don't be afraid to try new things. Um, so that was it for our speakers. So I'll pass it over to Noah, who will talk about our road trips to universities. All right. So STEM 103 was the course that we took actually a year ago now. It was last spring. Um, and this course, the focus was to travel to colleges and universities around Maryland. Um, and to just tour the campuses and get an idea of where we want to transfer to. Um, so one of the universities that we went to was Towson University. Um, now one of the things we did before each trip was to assess the courses that we're taking here at Carroll, like uh, this column here, and how they transfer over to the university that we were visiting, um, and then to just assess what we're doing and how it transfers um, to wherever we were visiting. So this is Kaylin's uh, course articulation for Towson University. Um, so one of the benefits of all of these trips um, and Towson here, as you can see in these pictures, is we got the chance to get a tour of campus from students who had graduated from Carroll and had moved on to those campuses. So at Towson we had two students who had graduated from Carroll as well as we also got the opportunity to meet a um, faculty member who works in the chemistry department at Towson. Um, so this is actually a video of that faculty member talking about the power of failure. Failures are a stepping stones to success. And that's what you get in a research lab. You cannot get phased out by failure. You have to fail, 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 pick yourself up every time you are pushed down and knocked down because you have to have self-respect and self-belief 
and you have to have the never say die attitude and amanda is an example student who is a go getter she will not put i'm not saying because she's standing here she and i have very very similar ideology we will we cannot accept failure you cannot accept failure you have to change every failure into success and in a research lab all your experiments you have to go in saying it is going to fail and you have to come up with a method and solution to fix the problem some problems take one month to fix some problem takes six years to fix that is why when you get into grad school your phd is not done overnight right mm -hmm. it takes a process it takes six years to have some people take seven years some people take eight years but then there is a point at which you stop that doesn't mean you fail you have done through all these other parameters you're very tested and you have a whole list of data which go towards building up somebody else's idea so never get disappointed when you fail so as it turned out that uh, that advice was definitely helpful this semester when we were going through our research um, and we'll talk about that later so one of the some of the takeaways from this is that um, well, I know Kaylin will actually be transferring to Towson, and I, this definitely helped weigh her decision for that. Um, it's a quality quality school. The research labs are really nice, and the campus is beautiful. So, um, another trip that we took during the semester was to go down to University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, this is a snapshot of Jack's course articulation for there. So these are his courses at Carroll and how they transfer to UMBC. Um, so as you can see, again, we got the opportunity to meet up with a lot of students who had transferred from Carroll to UMBC, and we got the opportunity to uh, just get a tour of campus from them. Um, a lot of them were in the engineering department there. Um, one example is Ben Wolf, who is part of the Baja Racing Club at, uh, at UMBC. Um, and so this is just a picture of us in the workshop there. Uh, this is something that he was definitely a lot, very passionate about. Um, and this is a video of Ben Wolf talking about mistakes not to make as a transfer student. They should know what school they're going to transfer to beforehand uh, because the transfer requirements for each school, each four-year institution are different. Uh, so I would have definitely, if I had known I was coming to UMBC, I would have done my coursework a little differently. I would have set it up a little differently uh, so that it made my transition a little smoother and uh, I would have got the best use out of my money as far as classes went. Uh, I wouldn't have had to take as many duplicate classes. Uh, and then other mistakes. Um, oh, realizing that your total credit count from the community college does not necessarily the the four year school does not necessarily apply the whole thing. So um, another thing that we got to do was sit in on a brainstorming session of the uh, Baja Racing Club, and that was a really cool opportunity just because it gave us an idea of what clubs do at uh, other campuses that we'll be transferring to. Um, so some of our takeaways from this trip was uh, definitely that it's important outside of coursework to get involved in things that you're passionate about on campus, uh, the clubs and stuff that you are passionate about, not just here at Carroll, but also once we transfer. Um, so another trip that we took was to University of Maryland College Park. Um, like I said, that's where I'll be transferring. And this is my course articulation for there. So those are my classes at Carroll, how they transfer to College Park. Um, so at College Park, we got the opportunity to meet up with 10 to 12 students. It was definitely the biggest crowd that we had. Um, and they showed us around campus. Um, it was really cool to meet all of them. There's a picture of us at uh, Taco Bell, Dr. Oz's favorite establishment. Um, and then we also got an opportunity to go into the engineering building and see some of the labs there, um, specifically the fire protection engineering labs we got to see. Um, and we met a postdoc researcher and um, a faculty for that program. So this is actually the uh, chair of the fire protection engineering program talking on the value of research. I think to the question of what, what prereqs it, it require, what background you need before you do research, it depends completely on the research project. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had students from freshmen to, to PhD students work with me on various research projects. And it really depends on the task that needs to be done and on the, the scope of the project. As we're setting up a room for a burn test, 
uh, of moving a chair from here to put it in the corner. I don't need a grad student to do that. We can have a freshman do that, or we have a freshman do a spreadsheet calc sort, sort of thing. So, so we would tailor the, the task to whatever background you have. Certainly having some a, a technical mind uh, is it, helpful just in orientation, it, it, as you said, and just having some, some sense for perspective, I, I think is important. Uh, and after that, it, it really depends on the project, whether it's a flame spread project or one involving fire dynamics or, or fluid mechanic, uh, hose, hose uh, force uh, sort of thing. Um, so some of our takeaways from there is just that College Park is a big campus. There's a lot of opportunities there um, and for research and even within a single discipline, say the engineering building, there's so many sub-disciplines to pursue. So it's something to think about for people who are transferring there, like me. Um, so then another thing that we did off campus for this semester, um, which would be last spring, was to go on this volunteer trip to Shiloh Middle. Um, we did this two years in a row. Um, so this is the 2017 group, and this is the 2018 group. So as you can see there, there's a lot of volunteers that go on this trip, all from Carroll. Um, it's roughly 40 volunteers. We go to Shiloh Middle School in Hampstead, Maryland, and lead uh, 200 plus eighth graders uh, at Shiloh Middle School through some science experiments to just get them passionate about science and uh, and about see see what it's like to go to college and uh, you know meet some Carroll students. So um, the last thing we did during this semester was to go to the Maryland Collegiate STEM Conference. This was the third Maryland Collegiate STEM Conference. Um, this wasn't off campus. It was actually held here at Carroll, and this gave us an opportunity to get our feet wet and really have an idea of what happens at the STEM conference because fast forward a year later, last April, or this April, we, uh, we went and presented there the research that we've been doing over the semester. So that brings us to this semester, STEM 104, which uh, has been our undergraduate research projects. So we actually started off uh, the last three classes that we've talked about, there were four of us. Um, but we added two new members to the group. That would be Ali Khan and Skyler. So, so they came and joined us for the undergraduate research. Um, and they're part of the next STEM cohort. So the first project that we worked on for our undergraduate research was, um, was taking a procedure for making aspirin and trying to uh, work through different aspects of the procedure, varying them, and uh, seeing how it affects the product. So a little bit of background on this project. Aspirin, well, aspirin hasn't been around for all that long. But for centuries, they have used salicylic acid as a means to reduce inflammation and deal with pain. Um, Hippocrates had his patients chew on the bark of a willow tree. Um, to help alleviate symptoms of inflammation and pain. Um, and he didn't know at the time, of course, but salicylic acid is a hormone produced by the willow tree. Um, and it's that molecule that was helping relieve those symptoms. So the problem with salicylic acid is that it can cause intestinal bleeding. It's very harsh on the gastrointestinal tract. And so um, Bear Company in the late 19th century was trying to discover a way to maintain the positive effects of salicylic acid while at the same time reducing those negative effects. Um, so in the late 19th century, a scientist working for Bayer named Felix Hoffman discovered that acylating a hydroxyl group on the salicylic acid helps, does, achieves exactly that. So it produces acetyl salicylic acid. Um, so the two reactants in the reaction that Hoffman discovered was, uh, were acetic anhydride, as you see here, this molecule, and uh, salicylic acid. So the reaction worked by first using an acid to catalyze, um, to protonate this oxygen here, which then is going to, this carbon is going to be attacked by the hydroxyl group on the salicylic acid. Then some bonds break and acetic acid leaves. So what you're left with is acetyl salicylic acid, which is more commonly known as aspirin. Um, so as far as objectives go for our project one of aspirin, what we wanted to do was to create a form of aspirin that was the most pure form that we could get as well as deriving the highest percent yield, percent yield being the amount of the product that we actually created. 
So we wanted to have a combination of both because you didn't want to have an, a sample be pure but not a high percent yield or have a high percent yield but have it not pure. So we wanted to balance that out. So some of the challenges we faced for this project was one, contamination, not so much with beakers, but that has happened, but um, more so with side reactions occurring within our main reaction. Also, not enough time. We didn't have as much time as we would have hoped to have. We only had about 10 weeks in which we ran a solid amount of trials, but if we had more time, we could have uh, different, different variables and had more results to compare with each other. And then lastly, determining which variables to change was our main challenge for this project because we had to differentiate different um, variables in order to get different results. And we had to figure out which ones to change. And I'll go more into that in a second. So um, yeah, like you were saying for that last one, the first one to two weeks of this whole project, we spent a lot of time researching uh, documentation that's out there uh, about aspirin and about aspirin synthesis. And this helped us to determine better exactly how we wanted to approach this project, um, exactly which procedure we wanted to use, and what aspects of that procedure we wanted to vary in order to affect our yield um, and purity as well. So let's get into the actual procedure that we were doing here. So this picture right here, this is just the five of us this day um, working the first week of trials that we ran. We weren't as familiar with the procedure as we would have hoped to be, but by this point we were starting to uh, get into the swing of things of setting up the different, um, different instruments and whatnot that we had to use in order to uh, actually do our procedure. Now this is actually getting into the procedure. This is our reactant in the beaker and we had it on sand bath heated at whatever the temperature was for that day's procedure. And after this um, step, we would then take the beaker, uh, let it sit out towards room temperature in order for, um, so the glass wouldn't break basically, because if you go from a high to a low temperature, glass will shatter. So then once it cools to room temperature, we would then add 50 milliliters of deionized water, which would um, crystallize the actual product. After this, we would submerge the entire beaker into ice water for five to seven minutes, depending on the day, and which would actually shock the entire system. After shocking the entire system, the, um, the, the solution is aqueous because we added water into it, so we had to dry it out in order to get a dry product. And to do this, we use a vacuum filtration, as you can see right, sorry, right here. There is a hose connected, and we would um, have the vacuum uh, on so that it would suck out the air and allow us to dry our product a lot quicker. Although this did take roughly an hour and a half to two hours each trial, so we would have a lot of waiting time. And then after this would be our, um, this is how we determine purity of the actual products. So once the product was dry, we would mass the product so we could use that mass to get the percent yield. Um, we had two methods of getting the purity. One gave us a specific percentage. Um, the one that gave us the most accurate data was this uh, Meltemp 2 device, which we used to get the melting temperature of each product. Um, one of the challenges here was to determine a specific percent purity. We went on the assumption that any impurity in our product was going to be unreacted salicylic acid, which, um, so we used known ratios of pure salicylic acid to pure uh, aspirin. And we mix them together, so 80% aspirin, 85% aspirin, and so on, um, in increments of 5%, and determine the melting temperature of each of those ratios. Um, we then used the melting temperature of each of the ratios and compared it to the melting temperature of our product in order to specifically determine within 5% what the purity of our product was going to be. Um, then the second purity test that we did was the ferric chloride test. So the ferric chloride test gives us a visual representation of how pure aspirin actually became to be. So right here we have Stephen actually running this uh, procedure right here. So what we would do, we would take um, a small amount of our sample, we would add it into these beakers, and we would add deionized water, and then add our ferric chloride. And the ferric chloride is going to react with unreacted salicylic acid, and when it does this, it creates a uh, purplish brownish tint to right here as you can see, and that would mean that our uh, sample was less less pure than we would have hoped, 
whereas if the color change doesn't occur much, it would be a light yellow transparent type uh, shade to the, um, to the solution. So that means that we did get a much more pure form of the aspirin that we were trying to create. And overall, we ran roughly 40 trials, probably a little more than 40 trials with different aspects that actually changed throughout the 10 week span. So let's go into a little bit of the data that we got. So the first six trials that we ran were just um, running through the procedure as it was, um, and just so we have a control data so that we could uh, compare our results to this control. Um, and then after we did that, the next thing that we did was uh, to vary the temperature of the heating of the reactants. So we went from, the, the original procedure called for a hot water bath, so that would be at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, but because we were using a sand bath, we were able to vary the temperature from 80 degrees Celsius in this trial down here, all the way up to 110 degrees Celsius. Um, we found that heating it too much at, let's say, the 110 would create the side products um, and would affect the purity of our product. Whereas not heating it enough didn't react enough salicylic acid, um, which again affected the purity of the product. So what we discovered was that keeping the uh, heat of the reactants at 100 degrees Celsius gave us the most pure form, uh, the most pure product, as well as the highest percent yield. And then for our third week of trials, what we decided to do was to change the ratio of acetic anhydride to salicylic acid. So the original procedure called for a three to one ratio, which would, um, we then determined that we should go up in ratio and down ratio. So we went up to a five to two ratio, then a seven to two ratio, and then all the way down to a two to one ratio. And we determined that, um, that actually the five to two ratio gave us the best percent yield as well as the highest purity. So then the next thing that we varied was along the same vein of varying the temperature of the reaction, we varied the amount of time that we kept the reaction at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so the results of this one were also not too surprising. It, eight, eight minutes, uh, we, did, we did one at eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12, 14, and 16. Um, and we found that heating it too long at the 14 and 16 uh, point would just add, it would add too much energy to the system and create those side products that we didn't want. Um, whereas keeping it at eight minutes was not enough time to react all of the salicylic acid. So we found that uh, 12 minutes here was the best trial. So moving forward, we use 100 degrees Celsius for 12 minutes for all of our reactions. And so for our fifth week of trials, what we decided to do was to uh, vary the amount of catalysts added into the reaction. The catalyst is what would speed up the procedure. So we wanted to see whether or not lesser amount of the catalyst would still work the same as adding the same amount as we had been doing. So we decided to go from three drops of the catalyst to five drops of the catalyst, which was our normal amount, up to 10 drops. And we realized that 10 drops was too much. Um, too much was being reacted and three drops was not enough. So we determined that five drops was uh, probably the best amount of catalyst to be used for phosphoric acid. Um, so then the sixth set of trials that we ran were to change the actual catalyst that we used. So it was always going to be an acid that catalyzes the reaction, but we wanted to change the strength of the acid in order to see how that affects the product. Um, so we used a weaker acid than phosphoric acid. Uh, we used oxalic acid. And we also used two stronger acids as well, uh, sulfuric and hydrochloric. So when we ran these trials, we found that the phosphoric acid was the best catalyst for this reaction. Um, so ultimately, you can see that's the picture of all of the trials that we ran. It ended up being over 40. Um, in the future, one of the things that we would want to explore, if we had had more time, would be recrystallizing the product. Um, that would affect the percent yield, but it could also make it a more pure product. So, so overall, what we determined for our project number one was that the best results that were given came from a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius of the sand bath, heating that for 12 minutes, and then having a 5 to 2 ratio of the acetic anhydride to salicylic acid. And then this is just a list of all of the um, equipment that we used and the chemicals. It ultimately came out to be roughly $400 for the whole project.
So then I'm going to have Kaylin, Skylar, and Jack come talk to you about project number two. So project number two is our campus sensor network. A little introduction. So this uh, project was revolved more around the Raspberry Pis, which are a low-cost computer, which are about the size of like a credit card, so it's not very big at all. So it's a great educational tool for like young programmers to be able to like navigate their way to programming, kind of like the job with computer science. And they're also used at NASA. So this project was inspired by Mr. Kudmore, who we mentioned earlier was a soft computer software engineer at NASA. Uh, he kindly agreed to be our external consultant, so if we had any issues or challenges that we could ask him for advice if he had any, or if he had any advice to give us little tweaks in our project. Um, so our objectives was to monitor two locations, one being in the K building, uh, room 306, and the other one being in Dr. Oz's office. Uh, we would monitor the environmental data, such as like the temperature of the rooms, the humidity, and the pressure in the rooms and we were to also make a security camera. However, we would not have this on at times, like all the time, we would only have it on while we were testing it, so we weren't spying on anyone, we weren't taking pictures of people without their permission. Uh, so a little bit of literature research, we wanted to see how the pies would work, uh, how to connect it to our laptops, how to connect it to each, how to connect the pies to each other, um, and how, like how basically just to use the pie by itself. Um, so for our setups and all the parts we bought, um, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero, so it's a little smaller than the like main models of the Raspberry Pi. Um, so it has a little less processing power, less things you can connect to it, but if you don't need as much processing power, it's a cheaper alternative. Um, so here's the Raspberry Pi 3. Um, we use the Model B, and so this comes with um, connector pins, which the Pi Zero does not have. Um, so we needed those for um, some hardware we attached. Um, and then it also has um, several USB slots. Um, so here is the monitor and keyboard and mouse setup we had. Um, so we use this just to get the Raspberry Pi set up um, and then just like install the operating systems on them. Um, this is our infrared camera. So um, up here you can see it's hooked up to the Pi Zero and um, the, there's a camera lens. It'll pick up IR and these are infrared lights. So these will glow red to shine that infrared light that the camera can pick up so that way it can see in the dark too. Um, this is our standard camera. This is made by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So um, this is just a standard camera with a standard lens but um, it takes good quality pictures. Um, so our goals for this project were to collect environmental data in different rooms like the lab room and Dr. Raz's office, that kind of thing. Um, then we can upload this data to a website, um, and then the website will graph it so we can compare it. Um, uh, another one of our goals was to create a security camera system. Um, so we had two cameras set up for that. Um, and then that system would upload videos and photos from any intrusions it detected. Um, and then finally, uh, we wanted to make a switch on that website, um, which would turn the camera on and off. So um, we could turn it on and off when we wanted to. Um, so here's a bit of our temperature data. So this is the Raspberry Pi with um, a sense hat. That's what records the data. So um, this is a list of all the temperatures, and then over here, is the date and time at which they were taken. Um, so this data can be graphed and you can look at the temperature change over time. So uh, up top is the temperature change in Dr. Raza's office over the course of a few days. And then 
um, on the bottom is the change in temperature over several hours in the lab room. Um, so this is when we were uh, first getting our uh, motion sensor uh, set up. Um, so we had just finished getting it working and Dr. Raza walked in the room so it took a picture of them. So um, it was good to see that it was working properly. Um, and then uh, what it'll do is it will upload these photos to Dropbox and then that way they're stored online. Um, so then if the intruder were to like take the device, um, they wouldn't be taking the pictures with them. They're online now. Um, so here's our switch. Um, so this, this will turn the motion sensor on and off. So if the motion sensor is off, it won't send any signals to take pictures. Um, so that's all for our setup. So Skylar is going to talk about the challenges we face. All right, here's just the list of challenges we faced during the project. And um, here's the first one is the real VNC. Well, when we get our pies, we have five pies, including the Pi Zero. We only have one monitor and one keyboard and one mouse. And the set of uh, equipment can only, um, we can only use it for one Pi. And after we install the operating system on each Pi, we wanted to have more efficient uh, way to have access to them. So we, after researching, we found that real VNC provides um, a remote control to the computers. So we installed the VNC server on each Pi, and then this is a picture, a screenshot of a VNC viewer that you can install on any of computers that you have, or even on your phone. And that shows I have the five access to the pies. And here's a picture of that when I was in school that I installed the VNC viewer and I can have all five pies. Uh, I can work with all five pies at the same time. So which increased our efficiency. And our uh, next one is the sense head which is uh, attached to the Raspberry Pi on, right on top of it. And the sense head will take the environment data, like the temperature, pressure, and humidity. And however, when we were testing it, the temperature is taking seem a little high. It's around 30 Celsius, which is about 90 Fahrenheit. So it does feel hot, but we want to confirm that this is not accurate. So we came with the idea of putting a camera in front of three thermometers. So each time when the sense heads take a reading, we'll take a picture of the thermometer of the room. So when, uh, after a period of time, we found out that it is inaccurate and is always five to seven degrees higher. But how do we solve that problem? We want to get the accurate temperature. After researching and also ask our unpaid consultant, Mr. Allen, he gave us a formula that involves the um, temperature of pi itself. So pi itself will get hot when it's running and the sense head will take the temperature that affected by the pi and the formula actually solved the problem. Our next challenge is the motion sensor. We were really excited to get this motion sensor on the day because we weren't really expecting to be this small. I was actually expecting to be um, this big. So as you can see that it came with the wire, three wires, and you can attach the wires to the motion sensor uh, with the white part. However, that uncovered part 
um, we will have to solder that on the pins individually. And solder each wire on a pin take precise work and a great risk because you, there's no turning back and you might mess up the pie. So what we decided is that we bought this female to female jumper wires that you can just, they have the plug on the end, you can just plug in instead of using those wires. So, but here's a problem. After we connect the motion sensor to the Pi, we were testing the motion sensor. The motion sensor starts to pick up motion when there's nothing happening in front of it. It was stressful. We didn't know what's going on. It's supposed to work, uh, like in the description. So, um, after a couple of days of um, trial and error, trying to see what's affecting it, we asked our uh, unpaid consultant, Mr. Allen. He told us that it might be because that the motion sensor is being too close to the Pi, that the Pi may give it a wrong signal that affecting it to read motion. <laughs> So he suggested to make the wire longer. So from a, a foot long wire, we connected, uh, use each wire to about a meter long to separate the Pi and the motion sensor. And here's the setup, which solved the problem and worked properly. The next challenge is the connection between Pi's. In order for the motion sensor to tell one of the pies to take picture, the connection between pies are needed. Um, so we have two cameras and we started with just one and the camera is the server and the motion sensor is the client. So they're connected by the server and client, the connection. So when the motion detects motion, it will tell the camera to take a picture, and that worked well. But we have another camera, and we have two options this time, is that the other camera, as you can see on top, is the infrared camera. Either it can be another client that connects to the same server, or just be another server. So we just tried the first plan, which the IR camera acts as a client that connects to the same server. And ideally, when the motion sensor detects motion, it will tell the server, which is a camera, to take a picture. After it takes a picture, it will reply to all its clients. And when the IR camera receives the reply, it will take a picture. But something went wrong, it just didn't work and that thought process was a little complicated too. So we decided to try the second plan, which the IR camera is another server. So we have two server now, which are the cameras. So what the motion sensor will do is when it detects motion, it would connect to camera, the regular camera first, tell it to take picture and hop off and connect to the IR camera and tell it to take picture and hop off. Uh, it sounds a little uh, more actual work, but it worked out really well. So that um, problem solved, we decided to do the second plan. The next challenge is uh, the decisions between Pi and IR camera. A problem came up when we were testing the motion sensor is that we set up the motion sensor direct to the door. When someone opens the door, uh, it will detect motion and tell the camera to take a picture. However, the picture only shows the door opening, but we want to see the person or see who he or she is. So we want one of the cameras 
to take videos or 10 second or 20 second video. And here's the decision that we have to make to see which camera we want to take video. Uh, here's a chart of comparison between the two. You can see that the two cameras have about the same resolution and the video size. But the regular camera is a little smaller than the infrared one. This is the regular camera and this is the infrared camera. And the infrared camera, when it's turned on, it has the red light that you can see. So when someone comes into the room, if you have this on, they can see, they realize there's a camera in the room. So we did uh, a series of testing to see how they will work. Here is the first one is the regular camera. And we have a, from the intrusion during, <laughs> Uh, during nighttime, and here's the and video call during the nighttime. <laughs> As you can see, that you can't really tell who it is, or even like s someone came in. It's pure dark. And here's the regular camera taking pictures under during the daytime, which is pretty clear. You can see who it is, who he or she is. And here's a video during daytime. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's the IR camera. Uh, we set it in a different angle. Um, so we have different views uh, when someone comes in. So um, it's just a little bit blurry, but you can still see who came in. And here's a video uh, of the IR camera taking daytime. It's a move a little forward, but if we move backward, we can see the whole person. And here is the IR camera taking in dark. You can see there's a person, and it's a little better than the regular camera. And Here's the video taken by the IR camera in the dark that you can actually see someone came in and maybe tell the appearance, some appearance of the person. So after a series of testing, we decide that let the IR camera to take videos because it has the night vision and let the regular camera to take pictures. After the our camera takes video, it's in H.264 format. So we have to convert that to MP4. And we can do that either on Pi or on, this, on a regular computer. And that's just the command window we uh, convert the file to an MP4 file. Actually, there's an extra challenge, or the biggest challenge that I really want to talk about. In the beginning, our group doesn't really have much experience on programming, except for Jack, who actually took classes of program. So this project is like, we have to learn from scratch. And going online, looking through articles, having many nights of frustration, but it was really fun to learn um, new things and to see this whole project to be able to work. And uh, here's the future focus. We were able to upload all the data to this website called io.adafruit. So you can see all the data just on a website if you have internet access. So the sunset setup is um, by itself is around 80 bucks. And then the security system is, with the two cameras, is about 145. And um, what we can improve is that this is the size of Pi 3. It's a credit card size. It's pretty small. 
However, this is the size of pi zero. That this will do the same thing that this can do in those two um, projects. But we will have to, as you can see, the pins on the pi three will have to solder that on this. So it will work the same way, just a little slower, but it will do the same job. So this cost will is about twenty dollars cheaper. So the whole price will go down uh, according to how many Pi three we used. And here's the total cost of our project, and came down to about five hundred. And Stephen will talk about the conference presentation. So. Um Back in April, we attended the uh, Maryland STEM conference at um, Power Community College, where uh, we presented, we had three presentations that we did. We did our um, Aspirin CSN poster presentations and our STEM scholars presentations about our journey through STEM scholars and what we have learned and our takeaways from, from the program. So this first picture here is, there we go, oh, there we are, all right. So here is the STEM scholars. We are attending one of the uh, many sessions um, at at Howard, Com at Howard Community College um, during the during the presentations. Now this this is of me and Mia and Noah. Um, we're giving the presentation on our Aspen project. Um, many people were just walking by during these poster presentations, and we were just talking about the processes we used, the data we gathered, and all the variables that we changed during this. This is another picture of uh, Ali is in this picture as well now. Um, doing the same thing, just explaining to many people as they peruse. This is the CSN Campus, Campus Sensor Network Project where Jack, Kaylin, and Skylar um, gave, gave that presentation um, on the data that they collected and all the, all the steps that we've taken to finish this project. Another picture of the three. This is of um, me, Kaylin, Jack, and Noah. We are um, giving the presentation on our two-year journey through STEM scholars. Um, we started in 2016, and we are finishing this semester. Um, we're talking about uh, how we how we got into the STEM world, like our uh, majors that we are pursuing, um, our journey through STEM, uh, how it's helped us grow as uh, just professionally and as individuals, um, help us get into the colleges that we would like to attend as well. This is, uh, this, is the, this is actually a video of Kaylin talking about how she joined the STEM Scholars program. So my senior year of high school, I was really undecided as to what I wanted to do with my life. So uh, senior year, when I applied to Carroll, um, my administrator came up to me and asked, like, what did you want to do? And by that time, I figured I knew it was sciences, but I didn't know what part of it. And he's like, well, there's this new group called the STEM Scholars. And I was like, all right. Because I'm nerdy. There we go. All right. And this is of the uh, STEM Scholars giving the two poster presentations of the ASPR and the, and the CSN. to 135 as we can and essentially if we get it around 135 we know it's pretty pure aspirin and that's what we're shooting for basically throughout our experiment. And then you say, then you do something. So this is um, this is our data sheet of the 33 trials that we have done so far. Um, the, we assume we are we have changed uh, three different um, uh, three different of the uh, from the original procedure the uh, variables. The first one we changed was the temperature of how how hot we are heating the uh, the solution. The second one. Can you see? Say something. So, uh, 
our yeah. Raspberry Pi for the our project. So our entire project is called the Campus Sensor Network. So one of our major we have three major goals. The first one is to be able to collect data such as you know the temperature, pressure, and humidity. And the second, the first thing we did was we set up the operating system for the Raspberry Pis, um, and then we set up a VNC viewer that allowed us to connect to the Pis uh, remotely, um, but have a secure connection. Um, and then third thing we did, we set up the sense hats. The sense hats record the environmental data like the temperature and Excellent. Oh, yeah, just point at certain things in the future. So, in, in order to complete our project, we have to connect our multiple pies together. So, we chose to use the server and client connection, so the pie can talk to each other. And then we successfully set up the uh, website, which like we can upload our thing. Well, I'm assuming that's not yours. So. No, he's not mine. All right. <laughs> So that was our poster, two poster presentations, and then this is just um, the six of us at the end of the go, at the end of the STEM conference, all together again. And during during our whole two year process, and especially during our uh, undergrad research, we were doing documentation in our STEM scholars notebook where we wrote down all the data tables from all the variables that we changed, um, all the research that we did. We wrote down in these uh, in our in our notebooks. Um, Anything that we even thought we would write down, um, our meeting agendas as well, we would we'd print them out and then write them down sometimes as well. And then our signature works were our uh, two papers that, that we put together um, for our Aspen project and the Campus Sensor Network. They're passing out um, each of our notebooks now. All right, now for, for acknowledgement, so we'd like to acknowledge Dr. Raza Khan and um, as being our mentor and helping us better come back. Uh, Okay, so the next group is going to be coming up the meeting agendas. Uh, for every meeting, we forward, uh, we form the robust rules, and they have to have a meeting agenda before they came in. And if you look at the agenda, I will always invite you. Um, and the final thing that you'll be able to do is uh, the STEM scholars uh, through your journey, and then their capstone papers as well. So appreciate one for yeah, so, as you can see, uh, there was actually a lot of work that we put into each one of these papers. We found each one's about 40 pages in length for both projects. And then a compilation of all our, our work, the capstones, which encapsulated all four semesters that these guys did. Unfortunately, me and Skyler only had two semesters so far. So ours are not being uh, uh, passed around. But uh, the other four have been, and you can see that they're quite extensive. All right, so we were, we're going to go back to the acknowledgement now that we have everything passed out. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Khan as being our mentor and helping us through uh, all these two years and giving us m massive amounts of guidance and preparing us for the future. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the Carroll Community College Foundation and the college and all the faculty and staff that helped us through our, um, through our two years and through our research project as well. And now this is... Um, so up here, this is the group. This is the day before our um, STEM presentation at Power Community College. And then on the bottom here, this is, uh, this is our group working on aspirin with uh, Dr. Khan. We are on the front page of the Carroll Community College homepage, which, was, uh, which is really, really cool. <laughs> and uh, now we're going to do the most difficult task of uh, handing over our STEM scholars notebooks. Okay, um, so with that, can I have the notebooks back? So this is one of the, as, as I said, you know, Karen promised she would not cry. Um, this is a point where actually they have to formally give the handbooks back. Uh, but before I do, um, they're a bit shy about quite a few things. You heard them, they said when they got into trouble, they contacted Alan Kudmore. Well, they couldn't. They had to go through me first. So I was the gatekeeper. And I said, well, what's the resolution you came up with? I want to hear from it. And in both cases, they had the same resolution that he provided. 
And by the way, it didn't happen over a day, it happened over a lot of time. Um, the other thing they're a little bit shy about that I'm gonna give them kudos to is when I started this, I didn't think that I would have maybe one or two graduate in two years. Because the reality is, right, we all know that our students take a little bit longer than to graduate. But it is awesome. It is just awesome that all four of them are graduated. That's just awesome for me. The other thing that's really awesome for me, and I do get emotional sometimes, is Kaylin, you know, she just mentioned in her word, but Kaylin got a, the, one of the prestigious GEM scholarship. That scholarship is not just a community college, it's open to a four year and private colleges. And places like Hood, it is right there. We were able to get that in the first year. The second thing that's awesome, by the way, I do look. I do love all these six of them. But I'm gonna highlight Noah Simmons. He got an FDS scholarship full ride from College Park. <laughs> so I'm gonna call one by one and then Dr. Mitz is gonna take them and again I am gonna tell you where they're heading to. So Kaylin Gales. Kaylin is going to go to Towson. So if you can acknowledge them please. Noah Simmons is going is heading to UMD. <laughs> Stephen Treadwell, he is moving to UMBC. <laughs> and finally, not the least, Jack Whedon, he is also going to UMBC. <laughs> With that. Thank you so much for all your support for the two last year for STEM scholars. I hope you had a great understanding of what has happened over the last two years, whether it was a Tuesday night or Friday night or Saturday morning or Saturday evening. Uh, they were linked on Facebook, they were linked on, I don't know, WhatsApp, I think. So tonight we are celebrating at? Chick-fil-A. I know, seriously. I gave in. This is the first time. Now this is the first time in 19 years I'm not treating out my students to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> so they know that, it must be special for me. So we're going out to Chick-fil-A this evening. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions to the scholars uh, about any of their work, feel free to do so. They're probably here till eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we go out. <laughs> thank you guys, thank you for coming. But again, if you have any questions for the group, please feel free to ask.